Okay. Um, again, for people who weren't here a moment ago, if you want to download the handout that I will be working from, this is my website. Um, click here, you'll be taken to an article that's got the handout. And you click that, you get the PDF file. So I recommend that you, you pick that up. Okay, so choosing an enterprise encoder. Um, here's our agenda. We're going to talk about what I'm going to cover and what I'm not going to cover. Uh, spend a little bit of time talking about what an enterprise encoder is. How is an enterprise encoder different from Sorrenton Squeeze or Apple Compressor, for example, or Adobe Media Encoder? Um, then we'll talk about the classes of enterprise encoders. I think it's, you know, I think there are three very distinct classes of enterprise encoders, and if you don't know what you're shopping for, you don't pick the right product. So I think you need to pick a class and then zoom in on that class and pick the right product for you um, in that class. And then once you understand which class you're buying from, what factors should you consider when you're making a decision between different encoding tools? And that's kind of the bulk of the, uh, of the presentations. You know, we've got an hour. We've got, um, you know, we should comfortably get through the material. So if you have any pressing questions, you know, feel free to ask. But, you know, let's try and save time at the end to, uh, to go over uh, most of the questions. Okay, so what am I going to cover and what am I not going to cover? I'm going to talk about on-demand encoding only. Um, not going to cover live, although a lot, of the, a lot of the elements of choosing a live encoder are very similar to choosing an on-demand encoder. If you need captioning, you probably need it for on-demand and live. Um, if you need support for advertising insertion, HLS, you know, the, the, the stuff we're going to talk about will apply to both, but my focus is primarily going to be on-demand. Um, my focus is not broadcast or cable. It's more, uh, it's more OTT uh, and also you know, traditional desktop and mobile. And I'm talking about products for local installation, not cloud. There's a session on choosing a cloud encoder tomorrow morning. And um, as soon as I finish writing that, I'll feel confident that we'll cover that very well. But, um, and just, you know, just to give you some perspective, um, we're going to look at a sheet that uh, has a listing of Enterprise encoders, it's only a partial listing, but there's still like 35 products on there. So I've looked at four or five products, and I've tried to pull from those lessons that you can apply to your overall search, but there's really no way to categorize all 35, no way to test all 35, test the quality, test the performance. You just can't, it's just too big a task, and by the time you finished it, it'd be obsolete anyway, because everybody would be rolling out their next rep. So really what I'm going to try and share is, you know, if I'm talking to a client or if I'm buying an enterprise encoder, this is the analysis I would go through. You know, I wish I could give you pages and pages of comparative facts and figures, but it's just not possible in, in this marketplace. <clears throat> okay, a lot of the information was derived from this book. I've got some copies on sale for 20 pounds. Um, come see me after class if you'd like a copy. The book was published in April 2013, so it's, it's pretty current. Um, Spend some time discussing what an enterprise encoder is. And, and a lot of people here, you know, this is a, a big company forum, it seems, so most people probably know the difference between an enterprise encoder and a, and a desktop. But, you know, for me, coming into it from the desktop side, it was how are these beasts different, you know, desktop versus enterprise? How is Squeeze Server different from Squeeze? How is Episode Engine different from Episode? And um, it varies by product. You know, all products are different. But here's some concepts that kind of, that kind of differentiate a, a, uh, an enterprise class encoder for me from a desktop encoder. Um, there's shared use. So enterprise encoders are typically designed to be used by multiple people um, and typically in an automated way. So most enterprise encoders have user interfaces, but they're primarily des designed to be used by watch folder or mostly uh, programming interface. So they're, they're, they're built to interface directly with your content management system, with your web publishing system, and the quality of the API is one of the things that you really need to determine before you can um, choose a product. Some of the desktop products are differentiated from the enterprise product by performance. So if you look at desktop versions of episode, um, you know, they only do two encodes simultaneously. They don't do split and stitch encoding, which really speeds 
uh, the encoding of long files, but if you buy the engine version, it's got unlimited encoding. Can, can, as many cores as you have on your system, you can have unlimited uh, encodes up to that number, and it has split and stitch, which really, again, does encode long files much more quickly. So the, the, des the desktop products are typically, uh, there may be some performance limitations as compared to the enterprise encoding products. Enterprise encoders, this is important, um, they're scalable. So there's a single point, and if you buy a desktop version of Sorensen Squeeze, there's no way to really cluster that with other versions of Sorensen Squeeze. You can, if you buy the server product, um, send jobs from Sorensen Squeeze to, to Squeeze Server. One exception to this is Episode. Episode is a cluster-like product, so if you have multiple versions of Episode Desktop, you can form clusters, send jobs to the different versions, but that's you know, Adobe Media Encoder doesn't do that. Squeeze doesn't do that. Uh, compressor does, but, but most people aren't using compressor in, in this type of um, application. And you get multiple encoders with failover. So if you have a, you know, one of the nodes fails, the encoding job you're working on is going to get sent to another, um, another output device. Enterprise encoders tend to put out more formats than some of the desktop tools. So you get single file H.264. You get fully formed HLS streams. You get the chunked data files. You get the manifest files. So you're ready to dump it off to an HTTP server and stream. Um, some, for example, um, that's not something you're going to get from Compressor. You know, Squeeze does that. Episode Pro does that with the command line tools. But most of the desktop tools like Adobe Media Encoder do not. Um, all of the enterprise tools that we're going to look at, they give you full support for HTTP dynamic streaming or HDS for smooth streaming and most of them have some provision for Dash. Um, how fully formed that is at this point because Dash isn't fully formed is, is kind of questionable but as soon as a standard does get created I'm sure it will be uh, implemented in all the enterprise encoding tools. Um, typically in this, in this class of product you don't see closed captioning on a lot of desktop tools. Again, that's changing a little bit. Sorensen Squeeze just came out with closed captioning, but um, it's not something you see on the standalone product, on the desktop version. Um, and then you don't see things like DRM support for major output formats. So once you're looking at D DRM, once you're looking at closed captioning, you're getting out of the class of the desktop product and you're more into the enterprise encoder. Again, programmability via API and plugins. That's primarily how Squeeze Server differs from Squeeze Desktop. Uh, enterprise encoders can be hardware. Um, a lot of products in the hall next door. You've got the Thompson products here. I've, they're showing their EM7000, which has HEVC encoding support, or we'll have it in, in, in a couple of months. Um, can be software. And you know, YouTube uses FFmpeg, so you'd almost have to call that an enterprise encoder as well. And in fact, a lot of the, a lot of the big publishing houses are using versions of, of FFmpeg. So that's not a tool that I would prefer to use, but I think it's um, you know, it's, it's in that class of product. So, what are the three classes I see? Um, class number one is the Swiss Army Knife Transcoder. You know, that's the, you know, one of the first enterprise class products I ever started working with was, was Rosette Carbon Coder. Literally take in almost any format you can throw at it, uh, output any format you'd want. Um, basically do anything to any file. may not do it as quickly as you'd like, but basically it's, you know, it, it, it handles everything. Um, if you need to work with Avid DNX HD, or if you need to work with ProRes, if you need to input that, if you need to output HDV or ABC HD, a Swiss Army Knife product will do that. Everybody needs at least one Swiss Army Knife product around because you need to work with those formats. Um, on the other hand, class two is the high volume transcoders. You know, these products, all they do is take in typically one or two limited formats of streams, and then they spit out H.264 files as quickly as possible. So these, these products don't know what Avid DNX HD is. They don't know what ProRes is. They may be taken in you know, MPEG-2 transport streams. Um, but, you know, their job in life is not to output HDV or ABC HD. It's to produce H.264, typically in, you know, all the adaptive stream formats that we mentioned a few minutes ago. And the most interesting class of product, at least to me, uh, these are the most nuanced, is, uh, is workflow systems. So, you know, workflow systems, they want to change your life. You know, they don't want to encode your files. They really want to just reform how you, how you work video 
through your systems, how you encode it, how you test it, how you get it from one place, how you send it to another place, how you format it. And what these products can do is they can make encoding decisions based, you know, on the ingest side, they can make encoding decisions based upon the metadata in the file. So they can say, okay, and say you're a service bureau. You're encoding multiple files from UGC sites or from different customers. Um, they have different buckets that may include different types of files. Um, they can in interrogate the file and see if it's an HD or an SD file, see if it's 16 by 9 or 4 by 3, see if it's interlaced or non-interlaced. And with that information, they can place it into a different encoding bucket or even kick it out. They can analyze the file and say, okay, there's two minutes of black video and no audio in this file. Do you want me to encode this, yes or no? And post, in, so that's the ingest side, quality control on the ingest side. And then after encoding, they can perform quality control tests that say, okay, how's the quality of this file? Is, the, is it good enough or do you want to re-encode because the signal to noise ratio is too high? And, and then some are starting to include self-healing workflows so that if the, if, the pro, if the file isn't sufficiently high in you know, however you determine that, whether it's signal to noise or quantization levels or, or um, SSIM, it will re-encode at a higher data rate um, if that's what you tell it to do and then it'll produce a higher quality file that may pass those tests. So this is a, it's a very, very um, intricate process but I think if you're dealing with files from multiple sources, you know, if you are a service bureau or you are a UGC site and you're, you're not really sure about the quality of a lot of these files coming in and you need to perform these checks, or even if you're, if you're sending files to customers, quality control is very comforting. Because if the, if the client gets the file and says, you know, there's something wrong here, at least you can say, well, we put it through our quality control test and we didn't find it. But hopefully you will find problems before you um, before you get them to the client. So what does this look like? Um, there's three products we're gonna look at that are in the workflow system class. This is a Harmonic Promedia. This is the old Rosette product line. Um, you've got your controller software up here. You've got Rosette quality control system here. The workflow controller is bringing the data in, running it through quality control here doing the encoding, sending it out through quality control, and then outputting the file to a playout server or to where, wherever you tell it to output the file. Um, this is what it looks like in the application program itself. So this is a job or a workflow inside of the um, harmonic workflow system. So here we bring the file in. We perform some quality control. If there's a problem, you click the, you uh, send the file out of the workflow and you send me an email. And when the file comes in, you deinterlace it, you encode it to all these targets. If there's any transcode errors, you again send me an email, you do an SSIM test, a drop frame test to see if there's any drop frames or to check the quality level. If there are any problems, again, you kick the file out and you send me an email. If everything goes well, you FTP the site where you deliver the file via FTP to another location. So it's very different from a single file in, single file out kind of, um, kind of process. And this is Telstream Vantage. Um, and this is a workflow within Telstream Vantage. So you could interrogate the file, get the height of the incoming file. Is it SD or HD? Is there a letterbox? Based upon those decisions, you place it in a different bucket, use a different preset, and then move the file to a different location. So again, you're not just encoding a file, you're making intelligent, informed decisions based upon information in the metadata of the file. And I've looked at both of the products that we, that we, we just saw. This is Digital Rapids Kayak, and this is a screen that I got off their website, and it looks like it's doing the same thing. You're building a workflow via the schematic, you're making decisions, and then you're treating each file differently along that, along that workflow. What do I like about workflow systems? Um, you know, it's more sophisticated. You can do more in an automated way. You know, you've got branching, you've got integrated quality control, you've got self-healing capabilities. Um, true, you can add quality control to any system via watch folder approach. Any encoder can dump a file to a watch folder that a quality control software can pick up and analyze, but then you've got two different systems that don't have integrated reporting. 
And you know, I think the workflow systems, if you're going to use quality control in your workflow, I think a workflow system is a better way to do it. And then the, um, you know, what's the negative? Uh, the cost. The workflow system is typically extra. So you buy the workflow package, you buy the encoders, you buy the quality control system. Most of it's a la carte pricing, and the pricing can be a lot higher. We've got Telstream both here and across the hall. So, you know, if these prices are wrong, you can just ask them. Um, they were right a couple of months ago. And then complexity. You know, your most encoding tools, you create a preset and then you're done. With a workflow system, you've got to build the workflow. Um, and it really, it's not rocket science, but it does, you know, there's a, a day or two learning curve to get, um, to get that functionality. What's the high level point? The high level point is, you know, if you want a workflow system, you've got to compare the workflow system product. You know, if you want a high volume H.264 encoding tool, you need to compare the high volume H.264 encoding tools. If you want a Swiss Army Knife product, you need to compare to other Swiss Army Knife products. So maybe there's not 35 products here, but there's a bunch of, bunch of products here, and these are not all of them. You know, it's not a comprehensive list. So if you're buying an enterprise encoder, job number one is, you know, which class are you buying? Are you buying a Swiss Army knife? Are you buying a high volume transcoder? Or are you buying a workflow system? So that's decision one. And I guess one other kind of key point uh, is that if you choose a workflow system, sometimes that can dictate your encoder selection. So if you decide that you want to use the Vantage encoding tool, things are going to go easier if you buy the Vantage encoder or the Vantage, their, their new hardware GPU-based encoder, right? So you think, you start out and you say, okay, I want a, the fastest hardware encoding tool in the world. Um, once you pick a workflow system, you're going to be dictated for your hardware selection by that workflow system, right? So there's another implication of the whole workflow. You know, if you, if you buy the Vantage, you're going to get the Vantage Lightspeed as your hardware accelerator. If you buy Carbon, you're going to get the Promedia Express as your hardware accelerator. So if you buy the workflow system, a lot of your other, or some of your other encoding decisions are going to be based on which workflow system you choose. You know, so I don't do a lot of service bureau work, but um, I, did a, I did a job where I converted uh, four three-hour DVDs to, I think, four adaptive streaming files each. It was tw 12 files, all about three hours long. And the thought of delivering that to a customer without any quality control was just chilling. You know, because, you know, you can look at a two-minute file to see if there's any problem, but if there's like a if there's a two minute gap in the, in the video file and that, you know, the customer finds that out three weeks later, he's going to be saying, what, you didn't do any quality control on these files? And it, it just really struck me that anybody who's delivering files to clients has to be concerned with quality control because that's the kind of thing that it's impossible to catch if you're only using human verification. But if you have a quality control system, it's easy to catch because every quality control system will, will, will detect that. So, you know, if you're, if you're, NBC or ABC or BBC or Sky, and you're dealing with all internally generated video, and the quality of that video is very uniform, and you have high confidence that there's not going to be problems, maybe you don't need a quality control system. But if you're delivering videos to clients, and you're in charge of, you know, you're in charge of uh, delivering them at high quality, I, I would be very, very nervous without integrating quality control into my workflows. So, and if, and if I have integrated, if I need a, a quality control system, then I'm going to get a workflow system because I think that's the best way to do it. Okay, so what's the high level buying process once you've identified the bucket that you're buying in? You know, number one, identify all required features. We're going to be going through that over the, over the, uh, the remaining time in the presentation. Number two, identify all candidates that meet those requirements. And I think that's going to be a pretty limited. Um, once you, you get really detailed about what you need, I think you're going to find there are only two or three or four products that meet those. Um, from my perspective, you know, I've looked at a bunch of encoding tools over the years, and there's no one company who has a magic bullet. Every company appropriately says our quality is the best, and I've never seen a substantial difference in quality between any of the high volume encoders. 
I've seen very, very substantial differences in throughput. And I think throughput is a very critical uh, differentiating factor, but I've never seen any huge difference in quality. So I typically, you know, and, and I spend untold hours trying to, you know, trying to figure, trying to work with the vendors to get the absolute best quality. At the end of the day, it's very, very similar. So I would always, my analysis would, would be quality is equivalent. And then, you know, once you've gone through the process, it comes down to a, a price per throughput. You need to produce a certain number of files in a certain period. You know, some products are going to do that very quickly. Other products are going to do that less quick, quickly. You know, how much does it cost using each alternative? And that's, that's the one that you're going to buy. And we'll look at some examples of that um, at the very end. So identify your required features. I mean, even if you're not using a workflow system, there's a lot of stuff that these, these files have to do. So there's, there's quality control that may or may not be part of, your, um, part of your requirement. Maybe there's some editing, format conversion, loudness control. Do you have loudness control here in, in Europe? We've got it in the States. Um, you know, packaging into, you know, you've got to identify all the required formats you have to support, all the inputs that you have to support. And, you know, you've got to think about things like monitoring, redundancy, quality of service, and all the output formats that you have to support. So, I mean, there's a lot of, the first thing you do is sit down and make a list. Um, and, and this is kind of what we're going to be covering over the next, say, 10 or 15 minutes. Number one is identifying code or class. We've covered that. Um, you know, this is kind of a cool slide from Vantage. Kind of shows you some of the Swiss Army knife type features we talked about. You know, what are the inputs that you need to support? Um, do you need to be able to control a deck? Do you need to be able to control a camera? Uh, are you accepting data in from an FTP server? Not everybody can accept from FTP. Not everybody can accept from S3. Um, so identify all your required inputs, all your required <coughs> formats, and then same thing on the output side. And they really, really vary by product. Um, you know, here's Harmonic ProMedia Express. I mean, Harmonic's a, obviously a very reputable company. ProMedia Express is their high volume transcoder for the carbon workflow system. And the only input it accepts is MPEG-2 transport streams. Why? Because their focus is cable companies. So you can't buy this product if you want to hand it ProRes, Avid DNX HD, um, any of the other camera formats. So you know, don't assume that any encoder you're going to consider is going to be able to input every source that you're, that you're working with. Um, you have to verify it. On the output side, here's a screen from Elemental Server, kind of a you know, every format you can ever think of approach. You've got Adobe Flash, Smooth Streaming, HTTP, um, HLS here, MPEG Dash, and also some of the broadcast formats. Identify every format you need to support and make sure the product supports it. I think at this point, HEV support, HEVC support is a very critical question. You know, Telestream has announced that they will have HEV support in, I don't know if it's all their products, but certainly in Vantage by the end of the year, if not sooner. So if there's no software upgrade path to HEVC, that's a very scary proposition at this point. Um, it's at least something you need to know. For some people, it doesn't matter. For other, you know, if you're, if you're looking at integrating HEVC into your workflows in the next 12 to 18 months, obviously you need to know if the encoder that you're going to be selecting has an upgrade path to HEVC or will just, we'll just have that capability at no extra cost. Um, you know, VP9 is kind of up in the air for me. Um, HEVC seems like it's doing everything it can to resist being widely adapted. Um, it's kind of a funny joke, you know, like, you know, they, they don't have a royalty structure yet. Uh, you know, there's no widespread player yet. It's going to cost money. So, you know, does VP9 have better legs than WebM had? I mean, I don't know. Um, but certainly it's a question that you want to, you need to make that decision yourself and say it either matters or it doesn't matter. And, you know, and then talk about, you know, ask about the web, the, uh, the web M upgrade path. And then also Dash. Again, I think Dash is still a bit on form, but I think it's going to come together in the next six to 12 months. You need to know with your encoding tool, are you going to support Dash? What flavor? What's it going to cost me? When's it going to be available? 
metadata support. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with this. I know that you know one of the reasons Telstream bought the Agility product line was because it did a great job with metadata support for all the output formats required by, um, by people who are syndicating their content to multiple places. So if you're, if you're outputting content and you require the metadata to go along with it to the different targets, then you need a product that can handle that and not all of them can to the extent that a product like Agility can. And then if you're the closed captions advertising insertion side, this is, you know, in the States, this is a problem, just a very challenging area. And I'm sure it's even worse in Europe because there's so many different standards involved. Obviously, if you're a broadcast company, you're going to need to support all these where you, you know, in the United States streaming, you know, people who are, or companies who are putting video on the web that was previously broadcast need to support closed captions. That came in the last, I guess it was last year or late in the year it came to being. If that's the current state of the state in Europe or it soon will be, then you need to know that the encoder you're going to be buying will support the broadcast standards for captioning that you, um, that you need to support and also the streaming standards. And this is a very dynamic area, a very uncertain area, um, but it's something that you know, I think all the reputable companies, you know, Thompson, um, uh, Telstream, Harmonic, the people who are currently selling to broadcasters on the broadcast side for cable and for satellite, I think they support captioning already. I think the companies coming from the streaming side um, that don't have a, a big base in the broadcast market, they're going to have a harder time getting this done because they don't have the years of experience with it. So, for example, Sorensen Squeeze Server is just now starting to get some of these capabilities where they've been in Telstream products and in Harmonic pro uh, products for years. And then digital rights management. Um, how many companies here worry about digital rights management? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not, I mean, obviously if you're a broadcaster, you do. If you're, if you're not, you don't. But I mean, if it's something that you need, um, we talked about multi-platform multi streaming, streaming to multiple screens this morning. Um, you know, some of the servers we talked about can transmux to different formats. You can take in an RTMP stream and convert it to HLS, convert it to HDS. Um, if you're doing captioning, if you're doing digital rights management, you need your enterprise encoder to handle th that side of it as well. And, and that's, a pretty, that's a pretty critical piece. And then if you're streaming to devices, um, you know, if you're sideloading to TVs or to Blu-ray players, DivX support and Widevine support is also a consideration. This is the Com Act in the States. Um, it sounds like there are some Euro European alternatives. Um, obviously, you need that to be handled by the enterprise encoder as well. And then we talked a lot about quality control previously. Where do you want to put it? You know, pre-encode posting code, how do you want the errors handled? Those are all questions that you need to determine. And then the API side, I think this is, um, you need to sit down and figure out which systems the enterprise encoder is going to have to interface with. You're going to have to have your technical people look at the API and then determine if that can give you the kind of, um, the kind of interaction that's required with your digital asset management system, your CMS, your enterprise control system. Um, and this is a very big piece that's going to be different from product to product. If you're looking at working with formats like DivX, then you're going to need an encoder that has support for DivX profiles. You're going to need support for the, D, uh, the DivX DRM. So basically, you know, if, I don't know, these are, a lot of companies are starting to move to DivX and to Widevine because they want to play with DRM on Blu-ray players on TV sets on some devices that aren't supported with, um, you know, with Flash or HLS. So if you're going to be using uh, DivX or Widevine, you're going to need to make sure that you've got support for that in your encoding tool. So you know that's the checklist of features, and then you're going to you're going to throw out a lot of products based upon them not meeting these features, and then it's going to come down to quality, performance, and then how many units do you need to um, 
to achieve the required throughput, and then things like redundancy. What's it going to cost me to get any kind of failover or redundancy in that system? In terms of quality, here's some examples. You know, I've been using the same standard files and the same standard encoding comparisons for about, you know, SD files since about 2005, HD files since about 2009. This is um, Elemental Encoder, their hardware uh, server, squeeze server using X.264 episode engine, X.264 Promedia Carbon. This is a very high motion, a very difficult panning sequence. And, you know, you can download the PDF and you'll, you'll, you'll get a better look at it, but I see very little difference. Nothing I would pick one system over the other uh, from, an, from a, a comparison like this. You know, here's Elemental, again, the same ones. And they're, this is a very, very aggressive encoding. This is 720p to 800 kilobits per second. This morning, you know, we, we compared that to uh, Burberry, which is 3 megabits per second. ESPN is 2.5 megabits per second. YouTube is 2 megabits per second. So this is a very, very aggressive encode, and we're seeing just very little difference in the output quality. And then here's Vantage, here's Elemental. You know, you just, I don't see anything here that would make me buy one, one system over the other. So all, and all the tests I've done are all like this. You know, they're all, you can spend hours, you go to each vendor, it's like, am I doing this right? Am I using the optimized comparisons? And it always ends up just so close that you can't make a call based on quality. And that's why I say just assume, assume they're going to be, you know, these are all very professional companies. They've been doing this for a long time. A lot of them use X.264, the main concept encoder. So, you know, they're using the same encoding tools in a lot of cases. You just don't see a lot of differentiation. Where you do see a lot of differentiation is in the encoding time. So I run several tests consistently. This is my adaptive streaming test, so it's a 52-minute 1080p file. I encode to 11 presets. These are presets that I put together for, um, I helped put together for one of the American three-letter networks. So it's a pretty realistic group of presets. Um, these are software only. These are encoded on a HP Z800, a 12-core system. It was one of the fastest around maybe two years ago when I got it. And these are GPU accelerated um, encoding times. So here's episode engine. This is software on the, uh, on the Z800. It's 63 minutes. Promedia Carbon, which I really thought was a very, very fast encoding tool, was very, very slow at uh, 235. Promedia Express was, uh, this is the new Harmonic product. That's 3541. And then the GPU accelerated products, here's Elemental Server. 2545 and Vantage Lightspeed, their hardware GPU encoder was 69 minutes. So this is one of the first versions of Vantage Lightspeed. They may have gotten better throughput since then, but those were the results that I had in the, in, uh, in the review that I posted. I also do kind of an administrative test, 24 one-minute DV files. This is more file handling, short, short files. Episode Engine was very, very efficient at this, 2941. Promedia Carbon, again, slower. Promedia Express, much faster. Elemental server still the fastest, but Vantage Lightspeed did much better here um, at 15 minutes. So whenever I test an encoding tool, you'll see similar tests to this for the cloud encoding tools that I looked at um, that I'll talk about tomorrow. So the quality is the same, but you see very, very substantial differences in the overall throughput. And I think that's a critical determining or differentiating factor between, between the various tools that you're going to be looking at. And, you know, I think you need, to, you need to build this performance into your pricing models, right? So you need a certain throughput. You know, if you're a network, you've got to produce, you know, 600 files a day. So if you buy one product, you may need, you know, two units. If you buy another product, you need six units. So you really need to identify your throughput. And when you're comparing the products, you need to say, okay, well, how many of these do I need to buy to get this level of throughput and, and how many of these? And we'll look at an example of that in a second. The other thing that you need to look at is you've got to build in the cost of the computer to run the encoder, 
right? So if um, the elemental server is a $26,000 product, how does that compare to you know, a software product that costs $9,000? Well, you've got to buy pretty much an eight or $9,000 computer to run that software, whereas the, the elemental server you know, is, is, is a, a turnkey system. So you need to build the cost of the hardware in when you're, um, when you're comparing the systems. So ProMedia Pro Express, $26,000. That comes with a, a two-computer rack-mounted software program. ProMedia Carbon is $5,000. So that's their much slower carbon coder program. Which product is cheaper? Well, it really looks like ProMedia Carbon is cheaper. But the ProMedia application server encoded the 11 files in 35 minutes. The, the single version of ProMedia Carbon took 155 minutes. So you need essentially five ProMedia Carbons to do the work of one Express. So you need to spend $24,000 in licenses, $30,000 on five computers if you're paying six grand a piece. So this path cost $54,000 and this path cost $26,000. So it really is important to identify the required throughput, try and figure out how fast the files can transcode, and then build that into your pricing model. And then the other thing you need to build into your pricing model um, are the costs associated with buying clusters. You know, if you need to cluster four or five units together, what are the costs of that? Some units just come together. You don't need a, you know, if you buy Episode engine, you can buy multiple versions of that. They will all talk to each other. You don't need a, crust, a cluster controller. You don't need a manager. With Digital Rapids or with some of the workflow systems, you need the $20,000 software program to run everything. And then you need the encoding modules. What happens if you need um, system redundancy? In some instances, you need to buy two versions of the workflow software. You need to buy two controllers. And then you need to buy the, the, the individual nodes. So go in understanding okay, we need no single point of failure. What's it going to cost me to get no single point of failure with five encoders running? And the pricing is going to, is going to be all over the map. And again, you've got, um, you've got a controller. These, you know, the Vantage has the controller sitting on top controlling everything, and then the different encoders are underneath that. The um, Digital Rapid, same thing. Elemental encoder, it's $26,000 for just the encoder and you don't have to buy any software to, uh, to make that run. Okay, that's all I got. Any questions? Long day, huh? <laughs> okay, well thank you for your attention.